If you would turn in your Bibles, please, this morning, to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 34. Second Chronicles chapter 34. I would like to get offensive this morning, if I may. Uh, from what I understand, a sword is a very offensive weapon. And the Word of God is a sword able to divide asunder this from that. And uh, the Word of God is the weapon that the church has to wield it in truth. Not, not necessarily to be offensive, but ultimately... When you stand up for the truth, when you stand up for God, some people get offended. Hey, did you ever notice that? Wow. So I just want to try to help you guys be a little bit more offensive. You're welcome. All right. <clears throat> Nobody cheered on that. <laughs> I imagine so. But I want to read this to you from 2 Chronicles chapter 34. Before I start to read, I just want to set the uh, scene for you a little bit. Long time ago... Way over there in the Middle East, there was a nation, right? And the nation had itself a civil war. Some went to the north, some went to the south. Ha! Huh, has that ever happened before? Hmm. Well, the ones in the north, they were called the tribe, the people of Israel, and the people who dwelt in the south were called the people of Judah. They both had kings, some good, some bad, right? Well, in the south... They had their good and their bad kings, and we're going to read about one of their really, really, really good kings. His name was Josiah. And uh, I, want, I want you to explore and think about what this fellow went through and how it really does compare to what we right now are going through. It's amazing. As I was uh, reading and studying this this week, uh, I was so impressed how God is always on top of things. But there was a king in the south named Ammon. He was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for only two years. Not a very long reign. Uh, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, just like his father Manasseh had done, and he worshipped and sacrificed to idols. But unlike his father, he did not humble himself before the Lord. He sinned even more. And Ammon's own officials conspired against him and assassinated him. So this was not a cool political setting at all. Right? Now, I, that was just a precursor. Now, all of you who are scrambling and looking side to side in confusion, now I'm going to start reading from chapter 34 about Josiah. I just wanted you to meet his father. So relax. I'm not out of my mind. I'm just a little ahead of myself. So... Now we meet a guy, and there's, there's, there's some math to be done here. Who here is good at math? Anybody? Not me. <laughs> so you, you, good, you people good at math, I will call on you from time to time if you don't mind. right? So in Josiah, we were meeting Josiah in chapter 34. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. Okay, I'm not really good with math, but I know eight is this many, right? Does anybody know an eight-year-old? I know, I've known a few from time to time, right? Would you want the, an eight-year-old to be the king of anything? <laughs> the boss of anything? How can this be? This is a miracle. An eight-year-old king, right? So remember that number eight. Eight-year-old, when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. So eight years plus 31, how much is that? 39, not so bad. You guys are pretty quick with your math. Good job. Here's the, here's the key right here in, in verse 2. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, and he followed the example of his ancestor David. He did not turn away from doing what was right. Now, verse 3, if you're really good with your math, this is an 8-year-old who just became king. In the eighth year of his reign, which would have made him how old? 16, you guys are awesome. Boy, where were you this week when I was trying to study this stuff and write and make notes? I sure could have used your help. So now you have a 16-year-old running your country. Boy, that's even more dangerous than an 8-year-old because I've known a few 16-year-olds. It's, it's amazing that they give them a, a, a permit to go on the highway, isn't it? 
well, how'd you like to have one of those 16-year-olds being the king of your country? So, no offense. <laughs> just, I'm just reading the scriptures to you. Don't get mad at me. I told you it was going to be offensive, didn't I? Anyway. So now he wants to do what's right, and he's 16 years old. So in verse 3, during the eighth year of his reign, while he was 16, while he was still young, Josiah began to seek the God of his ancestor, David. Now here's another thing. How many 16-year-olds do you know who are really seeking the Lord? I've known quite a few in my short life. You know, our youth group down there, Inferno, I met quite a few sincere teenagers who really were seeking God. In spite of their world, in spite of their culture, in spite of the media, they wanted to know the truth, and they were hungry for it. And it is so refreshing to see. And I've seen it you know, a few times in this very building downstairs and it has always blessed me that you guys know Maddie Bell and Nathan and uh, of course the lovely Fulmer ladies who've come <laughs> and my son actually married one of them lovely Fulmers and uh, you know ladies who, in their youth who have sought the Lord and wanted to do what was right it is an amazing beautiful thing this this fellow here 16 years old finds himself the king he doesn't know everything he wants to know more he wants to do better so he began seeking the Lord, and I think that is commendable. I applaud that every time I see it. So in the 12th year, he began to purify Judah and Jerusalem. Okay, 12 plus say what? Thank you. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. I'm going to be calling you guys during my study times, like, help me out with this math. 20-year-old. How many 20-year-olds would you want running your country? I can't think of too many of those, so I'll just let that slide. He began cleaning up the land. He was seeking the Lord in his heart. He wanted to do what was right. Not what was right in his own eyes. Not even what was right in his father's eyes. He wanted to do what was right in God's eyes. And, and one of the things he began to do was go through the land that he was the king of and to clean house. And I want to read this section to you. He began destroying all pagan shrines and Asherah poles and carved idols and cast images. He ordered that the altars of Baal be demolished and that the incense altars which stood above them be broken down. He also made sure that the Asherah poles and the carved idols and the cast images were smashed and scattered over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He burned the bones of the pagan priests on their own altars, and so he purified Judah and Jerusalem. He did the same thing in all the surrounding areas in Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, even in Naphtali, and all the regions all about them. He destroyed the pagan altars and the Asherah poles. He crushed the idols into dust. He cut down all the incense altars throughout the land of Israel. Finally, he returned to Jerusalem. In the 18th year of his reign, very good. Oh, my gosh. You, you may now move up one pew. <laughs> You've done so well this morning. Thank you. Now he starts to rebuild the temple. Here, here's, the, here's the progression here we noticed. An eight-year-old when he was 16 especially, started seeking the Lord, started cleaning all the impure, anti-God thoughts and figures out of his land. And now he notices, as a 26-year-old, he notices that the place where the ancestors met to seek God had fallen into gross disrepair and neglect. The temple that was in that beautiful city of Jerusalem was in a terrible state. And now, after cleaning up the land, and after seeking the Lord, now he wants to rebuild the temple, the place where the people were supposed to get together and worship the Lord, which at this time in history wasn't happening. People were not getting together and worshiping the Lord. So just reading on a little bit further. I'm just going to start with verse 9. They gave Hil Hilkiah, the high priest, money that had been collected to give to the 
Amish so that they could repair the roof. No, that's not right. That's, that's our story. That's not But there were always Amish in the Bible. No, just kidding. They do good work. They collected money t- for the Levites to serve as gatekeepers at the temple of God. The gifts were brought by people from Manasseh, Ephraim, and from all the remnants of Israel, as well as from Judah, Benjamin, and the people of Jerusalem. He entrusted the money to the men assigned to supervise the restoration of God's temple. They paid the workers who did the repairs. Now, those guys were Amish, (laughs) the ones who did the repairs of the temple. Verse 11, they hired carpenters. Need I say more? And builders who purchased finished stone for the walls and timbers for the rafters and the beams, they restored what the earlier kings of Judah had allowed to fall into ruin. Broken down temple, broken down country, broken down morals, broken down everything. A 26-year-old was being led by the Lord to help rebuild. He was doing something. Remember that. He was not just thinking something, not just believing something. He was doing something. And this is an exciting part right here in verse 12. The workers served faithfully under the leadership of Jehath and Obadiah, the Levites and the Mariite clan, and Zechariah and Meshulam, and Levites and the Kohathite clan, other Levites. Here's the exciting part. Of all who were skilled musicians. In other words, he got the band back together. We don't just have a new temple, we got a new band. So give it up for the band now, huh? Yeah. They were put in charge of all the labors and various trades. Still other, others assisted as secretaries, officials, and gatekeepers. He installed administrators and musicians and carpenters, and people brought all their stuff they could to contribute to the rebuilding of a beautiful temple that they were supposed to have been observing and and worshiping in all along, but they had lost their soul as a nation. They had let all the godly things in their land fall by the wayside. And when this young 26-year-old got it together, he was making it happen. He was doing something. And now, this next part is the most exciting. As I was reading it this week, uh, uh, something happened here. And I hope that this is the next great thing that happens in the United States of America. As I stand here today. This is verse 14. This is uh, 2 Chronicles 34, verse 14. While they were bringing out the money collected at the Lord's temple, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord that was written by Moses. In other words, here it is, the Bible. We lost this a long time ago. We haven't heard these words in years and years and years, not since my grandpappy was alive. We, we kind of uh, remember a little bit of this and that and the other, and we've seen things, but now, here we go. We have the Word of God. And I, I imagine as I'm reading this, that, okay, they're cleaning up the temple, they're rebuilding all this, and as they're redecorating and moving, and they, they push aside some junk, and they find it. There it is, the, the law, the first five books of the Bible. The very first one is the book of Genesis, right? Everybody has their theories and their ideas, but the book of Genesis says, in the beginning was the Word. I'm sorry, in the beginning, God created. I'm getting way ahead of myself here. Where did all this stuff come from? The book of the law says God created it. He created all of it. He spoke it all into existence. He formed the man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and out of his side he made his crowning achievement, the human female. It's the last thing he'd done created. He did a good job. Right, guys? Where did all this stuff come from? It says right here. Now we're holding it in our hands. Now we have our Bible that our grandpappies used to talk about. The Word of God. This is where we came from. This is who we are. And then it goes on to say uh, there was a flood because God had to put judgment on the earth because people got so wicked and selfish and evil. 
So God, the Bible tells us he made it all. But the, the Bible also tells us that God has one of these. Don't go too far off the reservation because he is capable of mercy and he is capable of judgment. That's what we learn in the very first book of the Bible. And then after the flood, after things on earth are getting reestablished, he found a man named Abraham. Now these people who are cleaning up this temple and rebuilding it and getting their nation back together learn where they came from, who they are, how God had called out Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob and the 12 tribes, and that's their history. That's what made them unique in the whole planet Earth. God did it. God called it. God ordained it. We're the people of God. We're, chosen. We're here for a reason. So when people learn from the Word of God, where they came from, who they are, and they learn their reason. They can walk with their shoulders high and their head held high. That's what we've lost in America. We forgot who we are, where we came from. We, we forgot that a long time ago, God says there was a man and there was a woman. I think the Congress pretty much forgot that. <laughs> I think a lot of schools and, and professors and and so-called intellectuals have totally forgotten that. I think if you ask any doctor worth his salt, uh, how many genders are there, if, if, unless he's insane, he's going to say there's only two. They were intended to be. And, and how God ordained that they be, how God created that they be, that is downright unpopular these days, isn't it? If we forget about that, what God did, what God intended, we drift away from God. And what happens to a nation that drifts away from God. They are ruled by unrighteousness. They, their temple becomes a pile of rubble, and the word of God gets lost. We see a young man, 26 at the last count, right? I, I haven't jumped you on that yet. Seeking God. Getting rid of all the pagan, godless things in his whole nation. Finds the word of God. Now he finds out his history, who he is, where he came from, where he's supposed to be. Because after Genesis, it takes us into uh, the life of Joseph, who was actually taken a slave into Egypt. And uh, he was betrayed, and how his brothers came back, and they had to own up to their betrayal and their falsehood. And he, instead of condemning them, he forgave them, and God called them in there, and they lived in safety for a number of years. And then they became slaves, right? They became slaves because of jealousy and hatred of the Jews, right? And then God sends them a deliverer named Moses. Moses didn't want to go. So God subtly convinced him, he and his brother Aaron, and they set the people free. And that nation called out of a sinful slavery was given their own land. And then we have the Ten Commandments and all the other laws in this book that uh, Josiah and, and the priest Hilkiah found. They're being reminded this is who we are, this is where we came from, and this is what the Lord requires of us. What we shall do and what we shall not do. How we should live and move and have our being. It's all spelled out in, uh, between Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, all those books, the first five. And, and okay, this is what God expects. And Josiah starts to realize Oh my, we haven't been doing any of this. We've been disregarding God for years and years. And we've, we've, we've cursed his name and we've worshipped idols and we've not honored our fathers and our mothers and we've not kept the Sabbath and we've all these things and we haven't been doing the sacrifices because we've all sinned and, and we need blood to cover our sins and it was instituted by animals before. And he learned about the Passover, how a lamb was slain to, to the death angel would pass over us and all these, and he's learning all this stuff. And we know because we're Christians, everything written in that law, everything in those first five books was pointing to a person. It was pointing to an ultimate event in human history. I talked a lot about that last week. The cross, the shedding of blood for the remission of sin, the lamb slain that his blood would cover over the sins of a nation, the spirit that led them through the wilderness, the word that established them became flesh and dwelt among us. They were learning. They were, going, they were on their way because they had a king who sought the Lord, who cleaned up the land, who found the word of God. And, and let's read about how he honors it. 
Just saying, I found the, the book of the law in the Lord's temple. Verse 16. Uh, Shepin took the scroll to the king and reported, your officials are doing everything as they were assigned to do. The money that was collected at the temple of the Lord has been turned over to the supervisors and workmen. Shapin also told the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a scroll. So Shapin read it to the king. The first time in his young life, still 26 as far as I recall, he heard someone read to him the Bible for the first time in his life. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Gosh, I know I just got that out of order. <laughs> I'm sorry. How's the first five go? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I said it right. Okay, for make sure I, I, I won't regret this. Anyway, he heard it. He's hearing it with his ears. Faith comes by and hearing the what? The Daily Times, the New York, this or that, the Washington Post. No! The Word of God changed this guy's life. And what's the first thing he did? When the king heard what was written in the law, he tore his clothes in despair. That this was a, a very Jewish thing to do. It was a sign of humbleness. It was a sign of repentance. They literally would rip the clothes and say, Oh God, we have sinned before you. We have totally dropped the ball. We lost all sight of what was holy. We're so sorry. And he cried. to the, It was his, him physically showing his heart to the Lord like, I am so sorry. We as a nation, we're so sorry. And this very act became a symbol of national repentance. Oh my, what if the United States of America would nationally repent? I mean, we could say, well, that person did this, and this person didn't do that, and this should have been done there, and that didn't happen there, and we could, yeah. Or we can start with ourselves. This all started with a 26-year-old man. He repented first, and then the nation followed. If we, in our hearts, when we hear the word of God, we repent first, our families see that. Our community will see that. Maybe, if enough of us do it, our state will see it. And maybe, if they see our state repenting and crying out to the Lord, maybe the nation will catch fire. And then, <clears throat> maybe, maybe more and more and more. And maybe other countries will see how the United States of America, hey, they could have, they accused this, they did this, they didn't do that. Yeah, but they repented as a nation. God heard them from on high. I think my, my dear friend Sting once said, <clears throat> there is no political solution, <laughs> right? We tried that, didn't we? Didn't we put our heart and souls and our prayers in the political system? Not so good, <laughs> not so much. I think it's time. My heart is telling me, and my study in the scripture is telling me that we repent as a nation. That we look at the law of the Lord. That we remember where we came from. That we remember whose we are. In spite of Egypt, in spite of this, that, and the other, God is alive. God is moving. God is powerful. God is a deliverer, but God is also a judge. This is what the Bible teaches us. There is a time for mercy. There is a time for grace. But there is a time for judgment. And I think all of us know this. Judgment is coming. Some say it's here. I don't think so. Not yet. You know why I think that? Because you guys are sitting here in the pew. If, you guys were, if this place was empty, <laughs> then I would say, yeah, but you know, the reason, the reason I'm saying this is this. You are vessels of the Holy Spirit. Every single true believer in Jesus Christ. You have been given the right to pray, to intercede, to seek God, to behold His holy word. You pray for your families. You pray for your communities. You pray for your nation. You have been invited to the table. 
you are allowed to approach God. You are. Read the New Testament. You are allowed to say, Father, this is screwed up. Please help us fix this. But first, I repent. First, I say, I'm sorry. First, forgive my nation. Forgive my community. Forgive my school district. Forgive. We've really messed up. We've lost. We've, we've let all these things come up. We've, they've built their ash poles. They've set up their temples to Baal. They've done this. That, uh, yes, we as a nation repent, but starting with me. You guys all bear that. You have the mercy of Christ in your hearts. And because you're sitting here, and because you've been empowered by the Holy Spirit, because you've been given the Word of God, that's why we, we got to see the sun come up, because Jeremiah told us, His mercies are new every morning. Mercy. Mercy is, of course, not giving you what you deserve. <laughs> right? It's, eh, okay, I'll give you a little bit longer. I think the United States could use a little bit of mercy, don't you? I think the Milnes family could use a little mercy. I think uh, Lawrence County could use a little mercy right now. I know the state of Pennsylvania could use some mercy right now. The United States, oh boy. I think we could use a little mercy. That's where I'm praying. A little mercy and some grace. Right? Let me read on a little bit more about <clears throat> Josiah here. After he repented personally, he led the nation in repentance. Then he gave the order to Hilkiah, the Ahakan son of... I, I'm sorry, I'm going to mess all these words up. Move on to verse 21. Go to the temple, speak to the Lord for me, and for all the remnant of Israel and Judah, inquire about the words written in the scroll. For the Lord's great anger has been poured out on us because of our ancestors. They've not obeyed the word of God. So just, just to cut to the chase a little bit, they sought the Lord as a nation. You guys can help with that. You can definitely do that. And a prophetess of the Lord said the following thing in verse 23. She said to them, The Lord, the God of Israel, has spoken. Go back and tell the man who sent you, that's the king, who is still 26 as far as I know, this is what the Lord says, verse 24. This is what the Lord says. I am going to bring disaster on this city and its people. All the curses written in the book of the law or the scroll that was read to you to the king of Judah, it will come true. For my people have abandoned me and offended, oh, I'm sorry, offered sacrifices to pagan gods. And I am very angry with them for everything they have done. My anger will be poured out on this place, and it will not be quenched. Oh my gosh, Tom, I thought you were giving us good news. That doesn't sound very, very, you know, good newsy. <laughs> we're talking about the judgment of God. I believe that same judgment will come on America one day, but not yet. You know why? I'm going to keep ringing, reading, ringing the bell, too. Verse 26, but go to the king of Judah who sent you to seek the Lord and tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the message you've just heard. You were sorry and humbled yourself before God when you heard the words against this city and its people. You humbled yourself, tore your clothing in despair, and wept before me in repentance. And I have indeed heard you, says the Lord. So I will not send the promised disaster until after you have died and been buried in peace. You yourself will not see the disaster I'm going to bring on the city and its people. So they took her message, the words of this prophetess, back to the king. So, why am I so full of hope? I saw a young man turn to the Lord and repent. I just read about a nation with the priests and the soldiers and the carpenters and the band that got back together and everybody returned to the Lord with a heart of repentance. And the day of execution came as a result. 
It's coming. Days are coming. But if we, it's going to have to start here, guys, in our churches, not just Elport, all over America. I believe this. And I keep saying the same things over and over again. You've heard me speak this for months now. But it's the Word of God. This is eternal. If I just went limp right now, poof, and became a steaming pile right here, right? I'd be done. The Word of God was before me, during me, and after me. The Word of God will never pass away. It's always been true. The Lord has spoken it. Put your trust in that. So, just a few thoughts here. After, after this reading, just uh, I want you to read chapter 34 and 35 on your own. After all this happened, Josiah led his nation in celebrating the Feast of Passover in his land. We are looking forward to Easter. We're, we're, we're getting ourselves ready. We're getting our hearts and our minds ready. We learned the importance of Jesus. I'm talking today about the importance of his word, how life-changing it is in our hearts. In our, and the result, we change. We repent. We grow. We pray. And God sends us reprieve. This Passover was just that. Judgment was coming. But judgment did not fall on those who had the blood of the lamb on their house. Did you hear what I just said? Judgment did not fall on those who had the blood of the lamb on their house. That's the word of God. That's not Tom's opinion. Okay? So you got to ask yourself, has the blood of the lamb been applied to the doorpost of my heart? Has the blood of the lamb been applied to the doorpost of my house? Has the blood of the lamb been applied to my county of Lawrence, my state of Pennsylvania, the Capitol, the White House, the Supreme Court room, the Pentagon? Has the blood of the lamb been applied to these things? By our prayers, we can, we can, we can invoke this. We have been given the right in Jesus' name. In uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God. It is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. The scriptures, it corrects us when we're wrong. It teaches us what to do that is right. God uses it, the scriptures, and he equips us. He prepares us, he, his people, to do every good work. So, we, the church, I believe, need to prepare ourselves. We need to get ourselves in a position to be equipped. And then we need to start doing stuff. All right? Learning, being prepared, and equipped. And then doing stuff. That first thing that we need to do is personally repent. The next thing we need to do, guys, as I read the scriptures, is live it out loud. Learn to say you're sorry. Learn to say I forgive you. Learn to say I'm praying for you. Learn to live that out loud. I mean, we've, we've been given the right to vote. Look at the issues, look at the platforms, pray about it, compare it to the scriptures, and, and do your part for your communities. You know, not every party line well, lines up with scriptures, we get that. But do what you can do according to what you have learned, according to what you have been equipped to do by the scriptures. You do that. In a hundred more churches, in a thousand more churches, in a million more churches, what do you think is going to happen? A lot of better things than what a political party can make happen. A move of God. We may see, ladies and gentlemen, the mercy of God yet again in our land. And there's going to be some people saying, well, that's impossible. Oh, really? Impossible. Think about that word. Impossible. That means not possible. You have possible and you have not. Not possible. Got it? You can't do that. It can't be done, right? Virgins don't have babies. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Impossible. Seas don't just part so a million people can walk over it. Impossible. 
People don't rise from the dead, Tom. Come on, are you crazy? Impossible. What about what the Bible says? With man, it is impossible. But with God, nothing. Nothing is impossible. So, the Washington Post said that. The Bible said that. Think about it. I would pick up the Bible before the Washington Post or the New York Times or I could go on, the media. You know the scripture I want to read to you. Oh, before that, I want you to think about something, the importance of the Word of God. Jesus, who was the Word who became flesh, we talked a lot about this last week. I won't spend too much time reviewing that, but you guys know that. He's the Word made flesh. He was baptized not for his sins, but for his coronation and the Spirit and the Father were there. And then he went off immediately into the wilderness and didn't eat or drink nothing for 40 days. Right? I couldn't do that. Never. For three days, I'd be going insane. <laughs> right? I'd be wanting a sandwich. Bad. <laughs> well, and the devil came to him. Oh, hunger are you, lad? You see those stones there? Well, you make them a loaf of bread. Being God and all, you know. I mean, of course, everybody knows the devil is Scottish. <clears throat> oh, look at you. Why don't you take yourself up to the tower and throw yourself off, you know? You're right? So what did, what did Jesus do? Nuh-uh, shut up. What are you talking about? Uh-uh, stop it. You're, you're rude. You're, you're offending me. I, my Bible don't say that. Every single time the devil come at Jesus, and he was weak in his flesh, but he was strong because he's God in flesh. Yeah. He said, it is written. Every single time the devil tried to bring him down or undo him or undermine him or destroy him, he said, it is written. He quoted scriptures to him. Our job, guys... Get so much of that Bible in us. Get so much of that living word in us that whenever someone pushes our button, the first thing that comes out of us is, how rude. You're insulting me. I'm offended. No, that was, a, that was a joke. Don't do that. When someone pushes your buttons, when something pushes your buttons, you say, it is written. Or thus saith the Lord. Yeah, that's what you say, but here's what Jesus says. You say it's impossible, I say it's possible. Because the Bible tells me so. You know that part about little ones to him belong? There we, yeah, you got all that, hopefully. One more scripture I want to give to you before I dismiss you to go eat all that pizza and that lovely stuff that has been prepared. I'm, I know I'm salivating right now. <laughs> this is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. The word of God is alive. Your King James says quick and powerful. In the Old English, quick used to mean alive. But in modern English, quick means real fast. <laughs> so however you interpret it, it means alive. The Word of God is alive and powerful. Anybody got a problem with that? Oh, those are old ideas. Old fashioned this. We've progressed beyond this, right? Who says that? Professors? Media people, politicians, they say that stuff. I don't care what they say. The Bible says the Word of God is alive and it is powerful. The Word of God is powerful? You better believe it. God spoke it. It became so. Every time. One breath from his nostrils, it's all gone. One snap of his fingers, it's done. He is the Word of God. This thing we hold here, this privilege, this honor we have of reading it, it is more powerful than anything. And you, Christians, you got it. And you American Christians, you know how to read. Don't you? Some of you? <laughs> hey, I came from Chewton. I learned how to read. You got no excuse. The Word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit. What you think and how you feel, God's more powerful than that. What you heard and what you believe, the Word of God can cut through that crap and tell you what is true every time. It's powerful. A lot of times, guys, we go off believing stuff that ain't true. 
we go off responding and living our lives based on stuff that is not true. It happened to me many times. But you know what stumbled me up? You know what tripped me up? You know what got me back on track? The Bible. I heard the word of truth. And I went, huh, I've been messing up all this time. I should have done that. I should have been going. The Bible clearly tells me this is right. And you get yourself turned around. And you get on the right track. Every time you fall. It's here. It's for you. It's at your fingertips. It's right here. And what a privilege. What an honor. The Word of God is quick and powerful. Alive and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Cutting between soul and spirit. Joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. I'm reading you from the New Living Translation. Go ahead and read it in, in your favorite translation. The Bible cuts it down. It tells you what's true and what ain't true. It clearly shows us the way we should go. It clearly shows us when we get off the path. It clearly shows us the love and the mercy and the grace of God. And it clearly shows us that judgment is coming too. It teaches us the goodness and the severity of God. The creation and the destruction and the redemption right in the middle of it. It's the story of God. It's the story of our lives. 66 books have been assembled over a 3,000-year period. Some read it, hear it, repent, re embrace it, and they are changed. Some disregard it. Some just want to burn it and cast it aside. Not too much comes from that. Be standing on the side of the Word of God. And when, I don't know when, when the hammer does fall, you'll be on the winning team. I believe, I believe you will, as I look out among me. I believe you guys love God and you love his word more than you love the stuff that's coming down the pike. I know a lot of you are broken hearted about the state of our nation, about the state of everything. And, and it's discouraging and it's, it's upsetting. And it could, it could seek to turn you. But don't turn to that. Turn to the Bible. Turn the pages. He's with you. He's for you. He welcomes you. That's what we learn in the Scriptures. So that is my word to you. This is the word. <laughs> not my opinions. Not my thoughts. This was here before me. It will be here long after me. So, we've learned about who Jesus is. He's God in flesh. We've learned that this word is like none other. It is our guidebook. It is our help. It is our strength. It is the revealed word of God. It is history, where we come from, where we're going. All the answers within these pages. We don't need to turn anywhere else. Do we? Anybody? Do we need to turn anywhere else? No? Okay, good. Just making sure you're awake. So I know you're hungry. I can hear your stomachs growling. Maybe you've heard mine over the microphone growling as well. We have lots of free food over there. Don't be prideful. Join us. Have a sandwich and then be on your merry way. And uh, we welcome you. I'm going to say a quick prayer for the food. And for all, for the people, for our nation. Please bow your heads. And let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word that is so true, that is so life-changing that is so powerful and alive. Thank you, Lord. Teach us this word. Give us learning hearts. Give us learning minds that we can understand it more and more and more as we go through our times. Bless it to us and empower us by your spirit as we go about our day. Help us shine in our families, in our communities, in our state, in our nation, Lord. May the church that you have planted, you have planted, you have planted, may it rise up in these last days and shine forth the gospel as never before. And Lord, I thank you for everyone here in attendance, for everything that they've given up, everything that they've cast aside to follow you. I'm just so grateful and thankful to be numbered among them. Just bless our day, bless that food prepared for us, and all the hands that prepared it. And uh, we give you all glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name.